Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was released on the 26th of May 1967 and went on to become one of the most iconic albums of all time. Having spent 23 consecutive weeks at number one in the UK albums chart, 15 consecutive weeks atop the Billboard LPs chart in the US, and being hailed by Rolling Stone as the greatest album of all time. However, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band never played live. They were a conceptual band, a medium through which the Beatles could escape the constraints, both cultural and pragmatic, that their popularity had highlighted. The decision that was to define their approach to Sgt. Pepper was also to define the rest of their career. Following their performance of Little Richard's Long Tall Sally in Candlestick Park, Chicago, on the 29th of August, 1966, the Beatles would never tour again. Before we delve into the more musical and technical developments made by the Beatles during the recording of Sgt. Pepper, I think we should have a look at the diversifying nature of their lyrics. The early years of the Beatles saw an abundance of influence from American rockabilly and early rock and roll, not only musically, but lyrically. Let's look at the first 11 singles released by the Beatles to chart in the UK. We will immediately discount the 4th and 8th entries, as the former was written and sung by Tony Sheridan, with the Beatles acting as his backing band, and the latter was a cover of the Tin Pan Alley standard, Ain't She Sweet. All nine that remain appear to be love songs of one type or another. Indeed, if you listen to their first LP with Parlophone, Please Please Me, you'll be hard-pressed to find a song that doesn't mention romance in one shape or form. In fact, I listened to the album. There isn't one. What's quite incredible, actually, is that in a 14-track album, only four songs do not use the word love. However, I don't think that's particularly surprising when you look at their influences. For one... Elvis Presley was somewhat of an icon for Lennon and McCartney, with Paul saying, that was the biggest kick. Every time I felt low, I just put on an Elvis, and I feel great. His eponymous debut LP also has a track list utterly dominated by love songs, with the opener, Blue Suede Shoes, being the only song that isn't explicitly romantic. Elvis was not the only artist to be pushing the Beatles in this direction, Buddy Holly and Little Richard also had a massive influence, with the Beatles covering songs performed by both. However, the subject matter discussed in the songs that initiated Sgt. Pepper don't really follow that trend. The apparently new source of lyrical inspiration is an intriguing one. This was not lost on Stephen Daniels. In 2006, he released an article titled Suburban Pastoral, Strawberry Fields Forever and Sixties Memory, in which he characterises this new identity as a suburban version of pastoral explaining that while the pop arts expressed progressive values in such realms as technology, social opportunity and consumerism, they also looked back, sometimes nostalgically, to an older country. This succinct evaluation is surprisingly accurate in the case of the Beatles. Their embracing of technology had a colossal effect on their music, as we will discuss later. Their egalitarian tendencies regarding social policy are perhaps best exemplified in their refusal to play in Jacksonville if the audience were to be racially segregated, while, when it comes to consumerism, they were stalwarts. Beatlemania not only enveloped the minds of millions, it also took an interest in their wallets. Following their overwhelming popularity in the US, the Reliant Shirt Corporation paid $100,000 for a license and sold over a million Beatles t-shirts in three days. Despite this, both Lennon and McCartney were no strangers to nostalgia. While Strawberry Fields Forever has a nostalgic title, the body of the lyrics tends more towards self-referential psychedelia. Penny Lane, however, hosts a cacophony of retrospective observations. In fact, the verses act almost as a running commentary. 
The first verse can be divided into four parts, in which every two lines encompass a new observation, as the listener is led through the environment, whether that be the barber showing photographs of every head he's had the pleasure to have known, or how the banker never wears a Mac in the pouring rain. Lennon's decision to write far more ambiguous lyrics than McCartney falls in line with what he perceived to be a shift in the nature of his songwriting, largely influenced by Bob Dylan. Lennon noted, Instead of projecting myself into a situation, I would try to express what I felt about myself. This would explain why a song inspired by his childhood experience wouldn't explicitly mention his activities, merely how he felt under those circumstances. That being said, the lyrics are still ambiguous, although this seems to be typical of Lennon's communication in general. Jeff Emmerich, the Beatles' balancing engineer, recalls Lennon's strange ways of describing the studio effects he wanted implemented. During the recording of Revolver, John wanted his voice to sound like the Dalai Lama singing from a mountaintop 25 miles away from the studio. In stark contrast, McCartney wants you to see the bigger picture. He wants to tell you a story. How you feel about it is up to you. Strawberry Fields Forever Those of you who know the track list of Sgt. Pepper will know that Strawberry Fields Forever isn't on it. That being said, Strawberry Fields Forever was the first song to be recorded during the sessions that were to create Sgt. Pepper, and it was only released as a double A side because of pressure from EMI for a new single. When compared with the titles of previous Beatles singles, It does stick out quite a bit. It doesn't have the fanciful whimsy of I Want to Hold Your Hand, neither does it have the call to adventure of Ticket to Ride. It seems a bit vague at first, especially if taken literally. However, when you know that Strawberry Field is a place in Liverpool where Lennon played as a child, things start to make a bit more sense. Despite being credited to both Lennon and McCartney in the traditional fashion, Strawberry Fields was written by Lennon in Almeria, before an extensive recording process radicalised the song. It is thought that the song accompanying Strawberry Fields on its double A side, Penny Lane, was McCartney's attempt to reciprocate Lennon's nostalgic inspiration. This kind of reaction would seem to resonate with George Martin's assessment of their relationship, as he said, John was the rebel, the Dylan of the group, and much more of a word man than Paul. Paul learned about words from John. While Martin was not privy to all the writing sessions held between them, his position as producer and arranger for the Beatles throughout their time at EMI, and his title of the fifth Beatle, as bestowed by McCartney himself, give weight to his opinion. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this interesting. In the next part of this Beatles analysis series, we'll be discussing one of the Beatles' most interesting and iconic choices of instrument.